This educational series is supported by independent educational grants from the following companies. Abvi, Astellas, AstraZeneca, Bayer Healthcare Pharmaceuticals, Inc., Janssen Biotech, administered by Janssen Scientific Affairs, LLC, Merck, and Pfizer Incorporated. Our first case today will be about biochemically recurrent prostate cancer and management of metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. The case will be presented by Stephen Borgian with Dr. David Gerard leading the discussion. Good day, I'd like to welcome you to the changing landscape of advanced prostate cancer treatment. Uh, this is a podcast that will review our case study number one, dealing with biochemical recurrence and with the treatment of metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. My name is Dr. David Gerard. I'm a professor of urology and vice chair of the Department of Urology at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, I'm also an associate director in the Carbone Cancer Center. The areas that we're going to be uh, looking at today are critical, and certainly ones that urologists interact very closely with. Uh, biochemical recurrence, uh, its workup and treatment, uh, has changed some uh, based on newer data. And furthermore, uh, there's been a real paradigm shift in the management of metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. For the last 60 years, uh, we have essentially just utilized androgen deprivation therapy alone in these patients. And over the last several years, uh, there have been a number of phase three studies which have clearly demonstrated the benefit to combination therapy in this population. I'm joined today uh, by uh, Dr. Stephen Bjorling, uh, who is a professor of urology uh, and the fellowship director of the Oncology Fellowship at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, and thank the AUA for having me today. So we'll start off with our first case, and uh, uh, Steve, if you wouldn't mind uh, presenting this. Sure. So the case here is that of a 64-year-old male who underwent radical prostatectomy and on pathology was found to have a Gleason 8 PT3A R1 N0 adenocarcinoma. He was subsequently followed without receiving adjuvant therapy. And 15 months after surgery, after having an undetectable PSA to that time, developed the first evidence of a detectable PSA with a PSA of 0.15. He was subsequently had a repeat PSA value three months later, which was 0.2, and then on repeat, 0.21. So at this point, he's 18 months from surgery for a high-risk tumor, has AUA definition confirmed biochemical recurrence with two PSA values greater than or equal to 0.2. He was otherwise well. He was without systemic or constitutional complaints. He had regained urinary function. Well, Dr. Borgen, when you... Think about risk of metastatic disease for this kind of patient. What kinds of factors do you consider to be the most important? Yeah, so I think that to that point, Dave, I think the key to managing patients with biochemical recurrence as several areas in urologic oncology is risk stratification. And we have to think about patient risks, we have to think about disease risks, and we have to think about treatment risks. So from a patient risk standpoint, some of the factors that are critical to think through are the patient's age and medical comorbidity status, because we want to think about competing causes of mortality. From a disease risk standpoint, we want to think about the PSA kinetics, and most specifically, I would say the PSA doubling time as we watch biochemical uh, recurrence develop. And we want to think also about the pathology features of the primary tumor from surgery. So things like the tumor grade, Gleason score, the tumor stage, the lymph node status, and the surgical margin status. In addition to that, we want to factor in the time from the surgery to biochemical recurrence. So there have been a couple of different risk stratification systems that have been put forth several years ago. There was a nomogram that was a result of a multicenter collaboration that was published in European Urology that can be used to estimate patient subsequent progression risk among those who experience biochemical recurrence, and it incorporates many of these factors. Most recently in 2019, the EAU put out a simplified risk stratification system for patients with biochemical recurrence that really just defines patients with biochemical recurrence as low risk or high risk. And high risk biochemical recurrence is defined as a PSA doubling time less than a year or 
the presence of Gleason 8 to 10 disease at the primary tumor from surgery. Low risk biochemical recurrence would be essentially all other uh, patients who, who don't fit either of those PSA doubling time or Gleason score criteria. So based on this patient, Gleason score from his surgery, he would be by the EAU BCR criteria, high risk for biochemical recurrence. So Gleason's grade doubling time is sort of an important, point, uh, important part of uh, the risk of these patients with regard to developing metastasis. So with, with regard to that point of uh, imaging, uh, at what point do you begin imaging these patients and how would you imagine? Yeah, so that, that, I think that that's the critical sort of evolving um, area that we have in, in biochemical recurrence and in staging of recurrent prostate cancer. Um, traditionally, conventional imaging with bone scan and cross-sectional imaging has been utilized for these patients. I think we're developing an appreciation that the diagnostic utility of conventional imaging with things like bone scans is quite low, especially for patients with a PSA at this value. Um, with regard to cross-sectional imaging, similarly, CT scan has quite poor pickup of disease in the recurrent setting at this kind of a PSA value. MRI of the pelvis can be used, um, and there is some data that would suggest a correlation between the MRI findings and patient's response to salvage radiotherapy for those patients, as we'll talk about, that are going to be considered for salvage radiation. Perhaps the, the MRI may add prognostic value to whether that patient would benefit from radiation therapy or not. I think, though, to the point of what we have evolving and developing, this is one of the most exciting areas in prostate cancer in that we have a, a whole series of what are known as next-generation imaging modalities. Um, and these are specifically a variety of different PET imaging studies with different radio tracers um, that, that may increase the detection level of recurrent disease at lower and lower PSA values. C11 choline is an imaging modality that we've had at Mayo Clinic and utilized for a number of years. I think one that's gotten particular attention and press and development has been the PSMA, PET CT scans, which again have shown extreme promise in detecting recurrent disease at low PSA values like this. This year, ASCO actually put out a joint consensus statement led by Ed Trabulsi on when to use next generation imaging in patients with recurrent prostate cancer. And very interestingly, they said that for the setting like this one, where salvage radiotherapy is being considered, next generation imaging should be offered with the idea in mind to help select those patients who are likely to benefit from additional local therapy like we would be talking about in the salvage radiotherapy setting versus those patients who might have disease elsewhere, as well as to identify patients with oligometastatic disease who might benefit from site-directed metastasis therapy. Yeah, and certainly another FDA-approved option is uh, the cyclovian uh, PET scan uh, be applied in these patients as well. So those are all uh, reasonable things to consider uh, in these kinds of patients. And uh, we now, uh, the general practitioner has access to this kind of more advanced imaging. So when you're considering salvage radiation therapy, so what kind of factors go into your consideration uh, as far as patient recovery as well as tumor characteristics? Yeah, so for the consideration of salvage radiotherapy, um, you know, we look at a couple of factors. Um, as I mentioned, we look at some of those, those risk factors that both the nomogram and the EAU would propose as, as, as particularly putting patients at risk for subsequent um, disease progression, specifically to metastasis. So in the patient here, for example, this patient had evidence of extraprostatic disease at C3A at surgery. He did have a positive surgical margin. So those are going to be things that are putting him at risk for local disease recurrence. He had a Gleason score of eight from his surgical pathology, which again would be consistent with a patient who would be at high risk for disease progression. He's 64 with no other medical problems. So his competing causes of mortality are low. And in terms of the evaluation of this particular patient, he did have an MRI of the pelvis that suggested perhaps some increased uptake in the seminal vesicle bed. Um, he also had a C11 choline PET CT scan that was without evidence of choline avid uptake anywhere outside the pelvis. Um, so this was a patient without radiographic evidence of disease outside of the surgical bed with, with some risk factors for local recurrence. Um, and so those are the things that led us to think through with this patient discussion regarding consideration of salvage radiotherapy. Great. Okay, well, let's uh, move on uh, with this uh, case. And this patient actually did 
uh, received salvage radiation therapy. Uh, he actually uh, obtained a PSA that was undetectable uh, at the completion of his androgen deprivation therapy. And again, uh, with this kind of high-risk patient, typically androgen deprivation therapy is given uh, uh, in at least one to two years afterwards. Uh, there are factors that can play into this, uh, tolerating one of those. Um, nine months later, however, after stopping the androgen therapy, the PSA began to start rising. He was initially observed in this situation, um, and as time went on, the PSA continued to rise, and subsequently, he developed right hip pain for four weeks. Uh, he was otherwise asymptomatic and continued working. And at that point, uh, we obtained the uh, image and uh, his PSA uh, at that time was uh, 12, and it demonstrated uh, multiple bony lesions, uh, six, six to seven of these bony lesions involving the right pubic ramus, vertebrae ribs, uh, and also the scapula. And the bone biopsy was done in this situation to demonstrate prostate cancer. A CT scan of his chest, abdomen, and pelvis, so he did not demonstrate any clear evidence of visceral metastasis. The worst summer at the moment. So, 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 Dave, I'll, I'll kind of take off here on, on, on two points. One, I want to just sort of reemphasize from the case summary um, that when this patient received his salvage radiation, he did receive androgen deprivation therapy. This has been another sort of area in the field that is continuing to evolve in an area where we've had prospective trials now to help inform us. Um, there were uh, there was a trial that looked at six months of ADT with salvage radiotherapy and showed an improvement in progression-free survival. And there was a trial that looked at two years of bicalutamide uh, with salvage ADT and showed improvements in overall survival. So I think, um, you know, reflective of that, the most recent iteration of the AUA guidelines do state that clinicians should um, be offering patients hormone therapy with um, salvage ADT. Um, so I think it's a consideration. I think it's, it, as, as you mentioned, there are se several factors that are uh, being used currently in that decision-making process for patient selection. But again, it's a point I wanted to, to emphasize in terms of our recent AUA guideline statements that this should be part of the discussion process when salvage radiation therapy is being entertained to consider salvage ADT as well. Now to, to, to fast forward to the patient in the, in the situation that, that you've outlined here now, he's unfortunately has experienced disease progression um, with multiple bony metastasis. So, so I guess the first question I would have is when you're when you're thinking through this patient scenario, um, how do you characterize the volume of metastatic disease? It's an area that there's been um, a bit of discussion on as new trials have come out. And certainly in terms of when we think about treatment options and guidelines and patient counseling, you know, getting a characterization of disease status in terms of volume of metastasis, um, you know, can you talk a little bit through that? Yes, this patient, uh had uh, seven metastases. Uh, and when we think a lot about the spectrum of metastatic disease, he's clearly a little farther along the course of the disease. When uh, the first trial that was performed with regard to androgen deprivation therapy and chemotherapy using dose taxone, they actually stratified patients um, with regard to the uh, extent of disease. And the stratification factor that was used was uh, the presence of visceral metastases and or at least four bone lesions with one, at least one lesion inside the vertebral column and the pelvis. And what they found uh, in this androgen deprivation therapy dose of trial, this was the charted trial, was that there was clearly an, uh, an improvement in survival in patients uh, with this paradigm. At the extent of uh, improvement was about 10, 10 months. Uh, that uh, was, um, distinction was less significant or smaller than the So, when you think about stratification in chemotherapy, uh, higher volume of these is an important component to consider. And, and, and this patient, as you outlined, had his volume of disease categorized with what we would consider conventional imaging now. Um, what about the role of next generation imaging in, 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 in patients with 
hormone sensitive or newly diagnosed castration naive metastatic disease. Um, you know, as we talked a little bit about before in the biochemical recurrence setting, you know, we have some evolving interest in data, perhaps that, that PET CTs with PSMA or other radio tracers may guide us. How about in this setting? So this is really an evolving area. And all of these trials were done using conventional imaging. So how the impact of some of the newer uh, imaging modalities, either flucyclovine PET or PSMA PET, which is clearly going to detect much more in the way of small volume disease, is going to impact our management, is unclear at this point. Um, you know, this will, I think, become uh, an area of study, and it is an area of study right now. But uh, from the, for the standpoint of, of patients in, in currently the modern era, uh, this definition of high versus low volume cancer is something we can apply to you know, considering uh, chemotherapy. And so for a patient like this, where conventional imaging has already characterized the patient as a high volume metastatic disease, would we obtain further next generation imaging? Would it guide us in a meaningful way, do you think? I think at this point, no. Um, I think most, uh, given that our patient was symptomatic, uh, and had higher volume disease uh, that we could consider uh, having a discussion of either androgen deprivation therapy plus these second and uh, third generation uh, androgen signaling inhibitors or alternatively chemotherapy. And the chemotherapy is typically given uh, as an infusion uh, once every three weeks. Uh, it's important to continue androgen deprivation therapy during this infusion. And the PSAs are typically drawn every three weeks. Uh, there are some side effects associated with uh, some neurologic uh, side effects. Obviously, uh, counts are decreased in these patients with the white blood count. And there are some other uh, side effects to consider, especially when thinking about older patients. But it's generally tolerated uh, well. So, so when we look at the AUA and the NCCN, guidelines for, for the management of this um, hormone-sensitive or castration-naive disease state, it seems that the, the systemic treatment modalities are chemotherapy and then AR axis inhibitors of some sort, all of which, as you mentioned, carried on in conjunction with ADT. So can you speak a little bit to, to individualized selection of treatment here in, in terms of the broad categories of who should be the patient where for this we're thinking about chemotherapy with dose tax. So who should be the patient where we're thinking about one of the available AR axis inhibitors? Yeah, so clearly a patient performance is an important aspect. Um, there are elderly patients that may have uh, a poor performance status and uh, would not tolerate uh, chemotherapy very well. In that case, we uh, lean more to uh, one of these androgen receptor axis targeted drugs. Uh, the rapidity of disease uh, also plays a role in this, and uh, there are situations where the patient will be very rapidly progressing. Again, many uh, medical oncologists will lean toward chemotherapy in that situation. And then finally, there is an issue of financial toxicity, uh, whether some of these drugs are paid for, especially the androgen receptor access targeted drugs, uh, and also patient preference. And for some patients, going through uh, a, uh, a course of uh, docetaxel chemotherapy that has a defined endpoint uh, is more appealing uh, than going through uh, being placed on the uh, oral agent uh, indefinitely and being exposed to the potential side effects of that. So those are all factors that are considered we consider in this situation. And within this space, Right now, there are currently four drugs that are approved in combination with androgen deprivation therapy based on trials. These uh, include abiraterone, uh, enzalutamide, apalutamide, and uh, are, the, are the two oral agents. So, all of these uh, have been validated in phase three studies. And when it comes to sequencing uh, of these, uh, those factors I mentioned that were determining who uh, to receive what treatment. 
I think as urologists, we obviously feel much more comfortable about doing oral AP. All right, now let's go on to the next uh, subject. Yeah, thanks. So I think it's critical that when we're starting our patients on androgen deprivation therapy that we are mindful of bone health. And when we think about bone health, we have to think about the risk of bone loss and the risk of bone metastasis. Um, here we have a patient with documented bone metastasis, and we are going to be instituting treatment that may accelerate bone loss as well. And it's been clearly shown reproducibly that skeletal related events, things like bone fractures, can significantly impact both patient's quality of life as well as uh, cancer and survival outcome. So, you know, the assessment of patients uh, for their bone health at the start of ADT should include careful history, things like a patient's fracture history personally, parental fracture history, smoking history, other medications, because all of these things can modify patients' risk of accelerating their bone loss in addition to the ADT that's being started. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a very reasonable baseline assessment is to obtain a serum calcium, creatinine, and vitamin D. Um, another baseline sort of risk assessment of the status of patient's bone health is with a DEXA scan. Um, this can sort of help define um, osteopenia and osteoporosis. And in fact, there is an online calculator known as the FRAC score from the WHO that can be used to quantify that patient's individualized subsequent risk of fracture. And we can use that FRAC score, for example, to help institute um, therapy beyond sort of what we would start at, at a supplemental level. Um, so at a baseline for patients that are initiating ADT, they should be counseled on lifestyle changes, smoking cessation, alcohol moderation, regular weight-bearing exercise. These patients should have ongoing monitoring of their bone health, for example, with DEXA scans. Um, these patients should be offered supplementation with both calcium and vitamin D. And then with the FRAC score, calculated risk of subsequent um, fracture can be offered additional bone modifying agents um, depending on what kind of risk of fracture is determined. Very good. And, and what kinds of uh, additional systemic therapy would, would be available to these patients? So there are, are, are several. There are bisphosphonates, there's denosumab. Um, and again, some of that depends on um, the degree, like I mentioned, the, the, the fracture risk, um, it, it's important to know, for example, that the dosing of these agents is different in the preventative setting in that state based on a FRAC score than it would be, for example, with a patient with castration-resistant bone metastatic disease, where the dosing of those agents, bisphosphonates, and um, denosumab is, is a bit different. Excellent. Well, very good. Well, uh, I'd like to thank uh, the audience and uh, Dr. Bojan for his uh, remarks. Uh, and again, we've had an opportunity to review uh, the rising PSA uh, failure patient, uh, what kinds of factors that predict outcomes, uh, what kind of imaging we should obtain, uh, when should we should institute uh, salvage therapy. Uh, we've also talked about a metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer and the, really the new paradigm of applying secondary agents in this kind of situation for functional and deprivation therapy. The last uh, subject we uh, discussed was uh, bone loss and bone maintenance uh, in these patients on extended androgen deprivation. Our next case is a discussion of M0 castration-resistant prostate cancer presented by Michael Cookson with conversation again led by Dr. David Gerard. Good evening. And welcome to the challenging landscape of advanced prostate cancer treatment. Uh, this is a continuing uh, podcast. Uh, today we're doing case study number two, uh, which will deal with the issue of M0 castration resistant prostate cancer. Uh, here, I'd like to welcome you to this podcast. Uh, the goal is really to define uh, castration resistant prostate cancer uh, in its M0 state when it's asymptomatic and non metastatic. Other uh, goals will be to um, evaluate uh, with a workup, uh, what are the factors we need to pay attention to, uh, when we need to start therapy, and furthermore, what agents uh, are now available. There have been a number of phase three studies that have identified newer agents for M0 castration re resistant prostate cancer. And this has really led to a revolution in the way we treat uh, this disease. 
Many of these agents were utilized later in the disease process and have been moved forward. So on the basis of these uh, randomized trials, we now have a number of options to offer these patients. Uh, previously, we typically just followed these patients until they became metastatic. My name is Dr. David Gerard. I'm a uh, professor of urology at the University of Wisconsin and the vice chair. I'm also an associate professor at the UW Carbone uh, Cancer Center. And this evening I'm joined by uh, Dr. Cookson, uh, who is the Donald B. Albers Professor and Chair at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, he is also the current president of the Society of Urologic Oncology and has served on the, as vice chair on the AUA Advanced Prostate Cancer Guidelines panel. Welcome, Dr. Cookson. Thank you, Dr. Gerard. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as you mentioned in the opening, we're going to review a case of a patient with non-metastatic CRPC, or that M0, um, as it's often referred to. So I'll go ahead and start our case. It's a 63-year-old gentleman who underwent IMRT and two years of androgen deprivation therapy in June of 2012 for a grade group four uh, clinical T3A N0 M0 prostate cancer. He had a really good response to the therapy, at least for the first four years, and his PSA natured at less than one. However, in August of 2016, his PSA began to rise. And over the course of the next year and a half, it went from one to 1 1.5 to 2.1 to 2.9. And then ultimately in August of 2017, his PSA was 3.5. And that was quite concerning to the patient and uh, his providing physician. So several questions for you. One is, at what point do you begin imaging these patients in the hormone sensitive state when the PSA begins rising? And the second is, what would be your standard approach for imaging in this situation? Yeah, so in the historical context in which this um, patient presented, I think it was very appropriate that he underwent negative conventional imaging. And most of the time, really, you wouldn't expect to see much in the range, even between two and four in, in these kind of patients. So um, that was sort of the standard in the day. Uh, I believe that now with some of our um, novel PET CTs, uh, such as flucyclovine, uh, which is FDA approved, um, as well as some of the soon to be approved agents such as PSA and PSMA, that we'll be able to find metastases at a very a much lower uh, PSA in these patients who have evidence of a rising PSA after uh, what appears to be failed local therapy. So it kind of depends on what tools you have available to you. But in, in, in this particular case, uh, the patient had conventional imaging, a bone scan, a CT, and they were negative. But if he presented today, certainly he would undergo a, a, PET, a second generation PET scan. Good. So what other aspects um, of this uh, case uh, should be considered? Well, um, this patient uh, was treated after his negative imaging. He was very anxious, as many patients can be, and he was actually started on androgen deprivation therapy uh, by his urologist. And again, um, that alleviated some of his anxiety, and he had a good response, but uh, surprisingly, only about 18 months of, of uh, control, and then his PSA once again began to rise. So in December of 2018, his PSA was around 0 0.4, and then it just kind of went up from there from to 0 0.6 in April. Um, in October, it was 1.6, and then it uh, essentially doubled to 3.9 in February of 2020. So by putting his um, rising numbers into a calculator, he was around a three month doubling time. Um, and uh, that prompted further investigation, again, repeat conventional imaging, and it was again negative. So in this population now, uh, the patient has a rising PSA despite being on hormone therapy. Are there additional labs that you would draw? And, and furthermore, Again, how do you define a PSA failure and how soon can you define a PSA failure? 
Yes. Um, so I think there are other labs. Uh, certainly, you wouldn't want to rely on a single PSA. So if if they had a single PSA, you'd want a confirmatory. I think um, you know anything in this range that's approaching two or above, despite a castrate level of testosterone, would would meet the definition for castration resistance, and um, that would probably be the extent of the workup at this point. Imaging testosterone and a PSA and a confirmatory PSA. So in a patient who you're following with a rising PSA in this setting, how often would you obtain imaging? Yeah, in the absence of treatment and in the absence of symptoms, there's really not a clear guidance on exactly how, but in general, somewhere on the annual basis, and some people might move the imaging to six month intervals. But you can um, go by the doubling of the PSA. So for example, if they have another doubling, that could trigger further imaging and investigation. Um, and then of any symptoms that would develop would also be a trigger for further investigation. So you alluded to the, some of these newer imaging approaches. Um, there's a lot of excitement surrounding PSMA PET imaging. Uh, and obviously, there's the FDA-approved uh, flucyclovine uh, PET scans or Oximin scans. What uh, uh, would you utilize that in this patient? And and in the trials that were done, uh, what were they using for th these studies? Yeah. So I, I think what we do today and what we'll be doing in the future are probably going to be different. But I would say that today, conventional imaging is certainly a standard approach to these patients who are castration resistant. Um, if we, and we will talk about these in a minute, but the um, therapies that were um, studied uh, were based on conventional imaging that was negative um, and a PSA only uh, rise. So I think that you certainly are on uh, good footing to order a conventional imaging study as your next step in these patients. We, we do know that um, PSA kinetics are really um, informative. And so some studies that were done earlier looking at uh, bone health agents and, and things like that, um, where patients were entered into these um, studies, no evidence of metastatic disease, and then they were followed without treatment, uh, they found that about a third of those patients within about two years would blossom um, evidence for metastatic disease. But when you sort of looked at what was most likely to predict it, um, while overall PSA can certainly be an important driver, really the PSA doubling time um, was the best predictor of the development of a, of a metastatic lesion. So some of the agents that we're going to be talking about used PSA doubling time as a criteria for initiating patients on these studies. Uh, perhaps you could talk a little bit more about uh, the role of PSA doubling time uh, in these patients, and, and how do you figure out when to initiate treatment? Yeah, when we um, look at the studies, and we'll, we'll briefly review those coming up in a minute, uh, one of the criteria for enrollment in all three of the studies were the patients had to have a doubling time of less than 10 months. So in patients that have uh, slow rates of rise of their PSA, um, remember these are all asymptomatic patients, so those patients um, are often safe to observe. And, and so, you know, anything that's above a year or longer is usually considered a slow doubling time. And those patients, um, again, observation may be appropriate um, given that the, the um, studies really were enriched with patients that had that rapid doubling time that was um, going to be more likely to develop that metastatic event. So, you know, for, to their credit, the studies really um, targeted those patients that were truly high risk for a metastatic event. Um, and that is um, really why those patients are probably the most appropriate for therapy now. Good. So it seems as if a patient with a doubling time on the order of 10, 12 months, uh, if it's longer, you'd want to observe shorter, uh, want to consider treatment. So let's talk now about some of these available agents and how they got their approval. Uh, there's, there are three agents now that have been approved to date. Uh, perhaps you'd like to run through the trials and uh, talk a little bit about these. So there were three studies that were um, uh, directed at these patients and 
from a historical context, as you mentioned earlier, for you know the longest time, we really had nothing in, in this space. And so when we would give courses and we would present some of the agents that were really designed for uh, those patients with metastatic CRPC, particularly those symptomatic ones, but um, we really didn't have anything for these rising PSA patients. And so it was um, kind of an embarrassment of riches when we had three clinical trials, those trials, um, the Spartan trial that used apalutamide plus ADT, the PROSPER trial that used enzalutamide plus ADT, and the Aramis trial that used darolutamide plus ADT. All of those patients, all of those studies enrolled patients who had those doubling times of less than 10 months. Again, conventional imaging that was negative for any metastatic disease, uh, two to one randomization with um, two out of the three patients receiving active uh, treatment and the um, one out of three would get a placebo. One of the things that was novel about these um, studies were that the uh, studies were designed with a primary endpoint that was um, metastasis-free survival. And so what that was was the development of a bony lesion or a metastatic deposit or death from cancer. But most of these patients would develop um, a metastatic site before you, they were going to die from their cancer for sure. So um, that was a new primary endpoint, and the, all three of the active agents met that primary endpoint. So that was, a, that was thought to be um, important from a patient standpoint, and certainly the FDA recognized that and gave these um, uh, drugs approval for that indication uh, for patients in the non-metastatic CRPC state. So it allowed the, a much earlier approval of these drugs rather than waiting for that final uh, endpoint of survival. And, you know, a lot of the earlier um, trials uh, in castration resistance were, you know, endpoints that were sort of three and six month type of things. But the, these studies demonstrated uh, magnitudes of 18 to 22 months um, of, of delay in that bad event developing metastases. So that really um, rang home with clinicians and it certainly uh, was appealing to patients to be able to stave off uh, this otherwise um, feared and uh, unfortunate event. So all three of these drugs are uh, androgen signaling inhibitors. Uh, they have uh, side effects associated with them. We're familiar with them in the castration, uh, more advanced castration resistant uh, state. Um, what kinds of uh, common side effects uh, are, are you encountering uh, using these patients or using these drugs in these patients? Yeah. So um, they, you know, the ADT alone, of course, adds uh, some element of fatigue to the mix. And then when you uh, layer on these oral agents, patients usually have some additional fatigue. Um, they can be at risk for um, falls and uh, with the competing uh, problem of androgen deprivation in an aging male with prostate cancer, certainly bone related events like fractures can, can come into play. And there can also be sort of cognitive impairment um, sort of a fugue or concentration complaints. Uh, there can be some subtleties within each agent, but in general, um, some of these uh, side effects are seen uh, to different degrees with, with all the agents. Yeah, and certainly, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, uh, enzalutamide and darolutamide, uh, or apalutamide, enzalutamide and apalutamide, um, the cognitive issues contribute to the, you know, the falls and other issues the patients experience. Um, you mentioned uh, fatigue as well. Uh, you know, uh, obviously, apalutamide is the newest player uh, on the block. Uh, it looked like uh, when that paper was published that some of the side effects were, not, were more minimized uh, with that drug. Obviously, time will tell uh, with regard to uh, uh, whether patients in the community will experience similar side effects. Well, what you say is important, and I think that it needs to be pointed out. So, it's really tempting when we see, you know, a study and it compares an active agent to a placebo. Um, so you can kind of see within that particular study, which depends on how often, how the questions were asked, 
and the grading uh, of the questionnaire, et cetera. So you'll get a side effect profile for an individual study. And it's tempting to take drug A, B, or C and really compare them to each other, but yet until they're really studied comparatively in the, in, in the same population, it's, it's really not appropriate to um, say, well, maybe this one has less or this one has more. Um, there are some unique things that can happen. So for example, you might see rash more frequently in, in perhaps the apalutamide than you do in the enzalutamide. Um, there's some thyroid function monitoring in apalutamide. Darolutamide, by its mechanism of action and the way the molecule is structured, um, may have less CNS. Um, uh, you know, it does have less CNS um, infiltration, if you will, but, and, and that could result in uh, some improvements there. But again, not studied head to head. And so I always try to encourage people to resist the temptation to say, I know this drug has less side effects because in their trial, they don't report, you know, this or that. So um, anyway, just, just uh, something to keep in mind when we say we have three drugs, their mechanism of action is pretty similar. Their side effect profiles are also pretty similar. And then there could be some nuances, but still needs to be studied. So there has been this shift towards uh, moving drugs earlier. And certainly one of the first drugs in castration resistant prostate cancer was abiraterone. What is the status of the use of that drug? And certainly it's been approved for metastatic symptomatic castration resistant prostate cancer. Uh, what is the status of that drug with regard to M0 CRPC? Well, um, I'm not aware of any large scale studies looking at abiraterone in the M0 space. Um, and I could say the same, you know, it's important if you look at the guidelines, these patients are currently outside of an investigational trial, not appropriate for chemotherapy, not appropriate for immune-based therapy. And while abiraterone um, may be something that could be beneficial, I don't think it's been studied uh, the way we would like. And so the level of evidence just isn't there in this particular disease state. Good. So we'll uh, move on then, uh, and perhaps you'd like to summarize uh, what's really the take home message uh, with regard to uh, the M0 castration resistant prostate cancer space, uh, this, this new paradigm. Yeah, so really exciting stuff that just came out in the last uh, three to four months, and, and we probably will see uh, more on this, but these studies when they originally were published and got their approval, met their primary endpoints metastasis-free survival. But what we're seeing now is with maturation and longer follow-up, we're actually seeing overall survival. So there certainly was concern that really all we were doing was delaying the inevitable, but we probably weren't extending the length of life of these patients. Uh, we now know, um, based on two out of the three studies that have published, um, that there is now overall survival, and it's about a 31% relative risk reduction in death from prostate cancer compared to the placebo arm. So again, um, very important when we talk to patients about what the goals of the therapy are, not only will we be able to tell them we're going to try and stave off the development of metastatic disease, but we can also tell them that this will on average improve their survival. So I think that's important. So if I were going to put together some take home messages, it would be that M0 or non-metastatic is a unique disease state, kind of an artificial or man-made disease state. Uh, we have three randomized trials that initially developed, uh, demonstrated significant metastasis-free survival. Um, that's the apalutamide, enzalutamide, and darolutamide. Um, longer follow-up has now um, allowed us to see that these patients will uh, benefit in terms of overall survival. And then we have to realize that next-generation imaging will probably um, decrease the number of truly M0 patients, but I think we're looking at another imaging Will Rogers phenomenon. Those that are truly M0 will probably even have a better outcome, and those with micrometastatic disease will probably have better outcome than what we're used to attributing to metastatic CRPC. So undoubtedly, these micrometastatic deposits exist in these patients. It's just below the level of our ability to detect it. So I don't really think that it gives the efficacy of these agents any less credence, but I, I do think that we'll have to kind of wrestle with the fact that 
conventional imaging was the way in which these drugs were approved in the future. Yes. And obviously, and we, this is not really a topic for tonight, but uh, we're giving these agents earlier are, are going to create a, a different uh, type of disease as we move farther down the spectrum. Uh, that is likely chemotherapy will be used in, in the future uh, for these patients after they fail these drugs. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Cookson for his uh, remarks this evening and obviously the audi audience for joining us. Uh, if there's any more information, uh, please visit the website at auanet.org backslash university. I'm David Gerard, and thank you again for joining us. Thank you.